Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hello, I am Teresa Griffin Kennedy, and you're watching another episode of Oregon Voters Digest. I'm guest hosting for the eloquent Mr. Bruce Broussard, and we have a wonderful show for you today. We have a very distinguished guest, Mr. Norman Cornett, is a university professor who has created a style of learning called dialogic learning, in which students learn in what has been called an unorthodox manner. Professor Cornett is a graduate of California Berkeley and completed his PhD at McGill University in church history. He is praised for his teaching methods and how they differ from, conser from conservative pedagogy and will be the focus of a documentary by Alanis Obamsawin, who is one of Canada's most distinguished filmmakers. Welcome to the program, Professor Cornett. How are you? Fine, and thank you for the invitation, Ms. Kennedy Dupay. Yes, Dupin. yes, it's good to have you here. So we have several questions. Um, uh, about your teaching methods and why they are considered unorthodox. Um, first, I guess we should start with number one. Um, does your teaching style apply only to religious studies? Um, that's a good question, Ms. Kennedy Dupay, because I am by training a religious studies scholar, but in the course of my research, publication, and teaching, I realized that the concept of religion or spirituality varies greatly mm -hmm. depending on the individuals, their culture, their background, uh, their worldview. And so this led me to expand uh, my pedagogy as a religious studies scholar mm -hmm. to explore the contours of religion and spirituality. For example, um, one area that I concentrate on is the relationship between aesthetics and spirituality. Mm -hmm. I work a lot with artists and what often strikes me when I work with artists, whether they be a sculptor or painter, a uh, filmmaker, is that the artist often perceives themselves as engaged in what I call a spirit quest. Mm -hmm. And they're seeking spirituality through their artistic um, endeavors. Right. And so, uh, yes, indeed, this, my dialogic approach, and I, I, I want to give credit where credit's due here. Where did I uh, come up with the idea of dialogic? Um, here I'm referencing uh, the literary uh, scholar, Mikhail Bakhtin, and his, uh, he had an idea that he called, um, published in a book by the University of Texas Press, The Dialogic Imagination. Mm -hmm. Well, I expanded on this idea of the dialogic imagination. Dia, it's a Greek word, it means between. Mm -hmm. And I believe that learning takes place in that interstice between professor and student. Right. Though I should say that um, I tend to erase those boundaries and mm -hmm. categories. Mm -hmm. um, I refer to all of us as learners. Right, right. Uh, it's just that we're on different paths. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on different at uh, different points in this mm -hmm. path yeah. we call learning. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, I, and I understand what you mean about uh, the, the learner and, and kind of having more respect for the learner's experience and, and, and go, doing away with the role, the traditional role of the, the professor, instructor, teacher mm -hmm. as being superior to the learner. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the old um, ideology of the learner being the empty vessel. So, mm -hmm. yeah. in, indeed. That's why I call it dia. Mm -hmm. um, the first principle of my pedagogy is that I have as much to learn from you right. as you yeah. from me. Yeah. And the reason I developed this dialogic method is that I realized that most often, uh, in my experience, um, education is a monologue. Right. And right. how long do we want to listen to a monologue? Right. Uh, what about a dialogue? Right. What, a, what about a plurality mm -hmm. of voices? Right. And then the question arose, as I, as I look at, this, at the fellow learners, as I call them, uh, there in the classroom, mm -hmm. and I refer to the classroom as a theater of, of learning, and we all have a role to play mm -hmm. in this drama mm -hmm. 
of the human condition. Right. So I said, well, look it, they hear me all the time. How can I hear them? Right, right. I agree with that. So yeah. the key to teaching for me is not the professor talking. Right. It's the professor listening. Right. So yeah. I created a, um, what I call um, a creative writing workshops mm -hmm. in all of the classes and in all of the fields in which I work. Mm -hmm. And in a stream of consciousness vein, mm -hmm. uh, all of the learners write down how they're experiencing the subject matter. Mm -hmm. And in the subsequent class, I read out loud anonymously mm -hmm. what the, the learners have read. Right. And do you realize what happens then? We're creating a collective conversation. Right. We're all learning from each other. Right. I'll give you one example. The, um, in the film of Alani Subamsuan, there's a still photo of the Prime Minister of Canada, the mm -hmm. Right Honourable Paul Martin. Mm -hmm. And so here I have in this, in this particular, and I don't even call them classes or courses, I call them learning communities. Mm -hmm. And so in this particular learning community, um, I had taken in agreement with the Prime Minister of Canada s various um, essays he had written. I removed his name. I removed uh, the title of the essay. I removed the page numbers. All they had were the text. Mm -hmm. So the writing had to stand or fall right, on its right, own. On its own. Okay. Now you can imagine sure. if the if the learners realize, knew they were reading the Prime Minister of Canada, what can I say <laughs> to the Prime Minister of Canada? Right. I'm 19 years old. Right. Right. I didn't tell them a thing, mm -hmm. and that we went through. Uh, in agreement with the Prime Minister, he and I had arranged this, we went through a series of writings that he wanted, he was ready to talk about mm -hmm. in, a, in a public debate on the issues. Can you imagine? He walks in the room, they have no idea he's coming, they immediately recognize the Prime Minister. Right, right. And then he sits down, and I'm next to him, and I start reading what they have written right. in dialogue with him. Do you know how empowering it is for sure. a 19-year-old sure. to hear their words mm -hmm. out loud, read to the Prime Minister of Canada, right. who then responds? Right. Education is about empowering. Right, right. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay, so um, I've read about you, and um, there is some opinion that you are considered unorthodox in your teaching methods. So why are you unorthodox? Um, well, I'm not sure that that's the case. Um, and, no, unorthodox. Uh, orthodox, of course, uh, means uh, it's a Greek word again. Mm -hmm. Doxy is mm -hmm. the, the Greek word for teaching, mm -hmm. as in doctrine or okay. uh, and the like. Um, so unorthodox means it's contrary to the true teachings. Okay. I would say rather, I'm an educator uh, that goes ad fontes, mm -hmm. back to the sources, mm -hmm. uh, back to the fountainhead of education. I'm thinking here of Socrates, mm -hmm. for example. Um, you know, Socrates opened up minds right. rather than taking a closed book with, approach to education. With the Socratic method, right? With, exactly. Yeah. Now, I, I've developed what I call a dialogic method. Mm -hmm. So I believe I'm going back to the mm -hmm. origins of education. Yeah. And now, I, I, I want to mention, too, um, as a religious studies scholar, what strikes me on the relationship between religious studies, Western civilization, and uh, this dialogic method Keep in mind how universities began in Western society. The first university ever was in Bologna, Italy, in the, in the, early, in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, in Paris, the Sorbonne. And soon thereafter, in the 1200s, in Great Britain, at Oxford. What, what were the roots, the origins, the beginnings, the fountainhead of universities in Western uh, culture? Well, first of all, they were all communities. Mm -hmm. They were founded by the Dominicans, the Franciscans, the Augustinians. So for me, education is a community right. phenomena. Right. And right. we want to bring community, the community experience into education. Mm -hmm. So 
that's what I endeavor to do, create a sense of community through learning together and learning from each other, that dialogue. The second uh, factor, I mentioned these communities, Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians, they are also spiritual communities. They were literally religious communities. At its best, education is a spiritual endeavor mm -hmm. because it addresses what philosophers call the ultimate questions pertaining right. to the human condition. Right. And so to bring back that, that it's not just about formula mm -hmm. or functions, right. it's about the human spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. The third um, salient feature of universities at their origins was dialogue. Um, they had robust exchanges. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a one-way street. When you think of Peter Lombard and his uh, seminal text, Sic et non, yes and no, they were going back and forth, this constant give and play. So that's the dynamics of mm -hmm. learning, of education. How do we breathe that dynamism in to university education today. So, um, if some, uh, there are references that my approach is unorthodox, rather I would say it's, it's renewal, mm -hmm. it's renaissance, yeah. it's going back to the origins of what higher education represented in the beginning. I, I think that's a really good point because I see that happening at Portland State even. You know, when I was an undergrad in 2003, I transferred there from a community college and uh, they were still teaching using lecture-based, very traditional methods and they slowly kind of converted over to a more, um, more uh, liberal way of teaching where they include the students and it's very different now because I think um, uh, pedagogical studies show that um, you know, lecture-based learning, people don't, they're not interested, it's not, mm. it's not, they're not involved. So they mm. don't retain, mm. they don't, they don't benefit, and they don't learn critical thinking skills because there is no dialogue. So, if there's a great yeah. lecturer, it works wonders. Yeah, yeah. This said, you brought up a very important point, Ms. Kennedy Dupe. <clears throat> How many businesses w would continue to survive, much less thrive, if they were using a business model from the Middle Ages. <laughs> right. The, the mm -hmm. traditional orthodox right. teaching right. Um, is the lecture mode yeah. to which you're referring. So I think we have to question, mm -hmm. has the time come for renewal, mm -hmm. for reform? Yeah. And that, I believe, would we permit an, a model that is as old as the Middle Ages could it survive yeah. in a free market mm -hmm. of ideas? Mm -hmm. And so th that's where we need to ask ourselves uh, basic questions about higher education today. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we stay in just a one track way of teaching, there is a clear and present danger of what I refer to as intellectual sclerosis yes. setting in. Yes. Uh, so how do we Renew. Right, yeah. Education. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. So you are involved in a lot of different forms of teaching and you're a, a huge fan of jazz. So why does jazz matter to the dialogic sessions that you conduct? E excellent question. Um, the operative principle of jazz is improvisation. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if our educational model is quizzes, midterms, finals, exams, essays in which you memorize mm -hmm. and then repeat, right. what room do we leave for improvisation? Right. Why do I bring this up? Because improvisation is that the dynamic of creativity. Mm -hmm. And that's what, for me, jazz is a pedagogical paradigm mm -hmm. of learning to think on our feet, right. learning to improvise, right. uh, improvise, mm -hmm. learning to intuit. Mm -hmm. Why do I mention this? Because I also work with neuroscientists, spe specifically on the issue of cognitive acquisition, the fancy term for how do we learn. Right. 
I'm always asking myself, how do we learn? <laughs> how could we learn better? Right. Well, one of the things we do uh, is we essentially exercise out the whole dimension of improvising, of intuity, of thinking on our feet, because it's all formatted. And there's just this category mm -hmm. in which you've got to fit. Right. Well, we know from neurological studies that, in fact, much of the brain's activity is improvisational. Right. For example, when we come to a street corner and the light turns from red to green, they now can map like through MRIs, mm -hmm. they can map what's happening in the brain. All the synapses, all right. the decisions, right. all the data processing that's mm -hmm. taking place. So I believe that we need to encourage improvisation, right. encourage intuition, because in that way, we're encouraging creativity. Right. And creativity is that which distinguishes us from all other species on the planet. And language. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, th th there are some, <laughs> uh, some linguists are, are contesting that. But creativity. Yeah, yeah. So the question we want to ask ourselves in the classroom, whether it be in, in um, uh, preschool, mm -hmm. whether it be in elementary school, whether it be in middle school, high school, and of course in higher education, to what extent do we create a space mm -hmm. for improvisation? More importantly, for creativity. If that's what makes us human, mm -hmm. then that's what we want to encourage. That's what we want to foster. That's what we want to develop. And this brings me, uh, of course, and that's, that's what jazz in, mm -hmm. uh, has in common with my dialogic mm -hmm. approach. Now, I should say that for me, the touchstone of teaching, even though I'm a university professor, mm -hmm. and I've all my career have taught only at the higher education level, mm -hmm. at the university level. Mm -hmm. For me, ironically, Ms. Kennedy Duplay, the touchstone of teaching is the child. Mm -hmm. Because you see, for the child, everything is possible. Right. So, right. Yeah. Ms. Kennedy Duplay, when I teach, I teach the child in the adult. Right. The child who naturally improvises, right. who naturally intuits, mm -hmm. who naturally expresses themselves. Right. Pablo Picasso made a very important remark. Every child is born an artist. Mm -hmm. yeah. We take the artist out of them. Yes. yes. So the goal of higher education for me is to help the learner, mm -hmm. aka student, mm -hmm. rediscover right. Right. the child, the creativity mm -hmm. within themselves. Mm -hmm. Learn to think, to improvise, to intuit. Right. And why do I say this? Because, you know, once they walk off that campus, once they get their diploma, right. what bookstore are they going to go to? What co-op are they going to buy the course pack on the, the book of life? Right. right. What, we need, what we want to do in university education is encourage people to think for themselves, right. how to inform themselves, yeah. how to make informed de mm -hmm. decisions, how to become full-orbed citizens. Mm -hmm. And that entails encouraging improvisation, right. encouraging creativity, because at the same time what you're doing is you're communicating to the learner to trust themselves, right. to have faith right. in themselves. Yeah. The greatest gift an educator can give to a fellow learner is confidence right. in themselves. So, to foster that sense of self-efficacy and that sense of self-agency. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I totally now, and, agree. I, and I should mention, this relates cogently to enterprise, to business, to mm -hmm. commerce. Mm -hmm. To my amazement, I received an invitation to the National Geographic Museum uh, in Washington, D.C. Now, that happens also to be the headquarters of the World Bank. Oh, wow. And this was in, this was during the crisis. I mean, you know, uh, the bubble had burst mm -hmm. and America was in economic dire straits. Mm -hmm. And so 
I'm speaking and I see all these people in, in blue pin suits and very, and they're asking me questions and I'm, then I ask them a question. I ask the audience, who are you? <laughs> they said, we're from the World Bank. Mm -hmm. I said, what are you doing here? And they said, the key out of this crisis is creativity. Right. And what you teach is creativity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, I'm interested. I, I, I wrote down a couple questions here myself, but um, what is your opinion on the changing paradigms in pedagogy and how that relates to student learning? Um, uh, because I know that what you're what you're talking about is happening in a lot of places, but it's slower in some cities and it's quicker in other cities. This changing paradigm in education. Well, there there are many uh, different monikers uh, that are employed. Some mm -hmm. refer to it as alternative learning. Mm -hmm. Others refer to it as uh, radical teaching. Mm -hmm. um, some refer to it as um, optional. Uh, I think it's good. We're asking our uh, selves these kind of questions. Yeah. Um, what intrigues me, and getting back to neuroscience and cognitive acquisition, North America, whether we're talking the United States, whether we're talking Canada, where I'm from, we have, in the developing world, we have among the highest dropout right. rates right. Yeah. in the developed world. Right. So I'm saying to myself, Houston, we got a problem here. Right. Why is it? Ms. Kennedy, Dupay, for 15 years I taught at an institution that everybody had to apply for admittance and the standards were very, very high. Um, you can't tell me it's because all these adolescents are lacking intelligence. Mm -hmm. I know. Why is it they're willing to spend hours and hours on video games, yeah. on the internet. Right. It's because, as psychologists refer to it, those, those means are meeting felt needs. Right. So right. we need to ask ourselves, that, and that's the whole affective dimension mm -hmm. of education, mm -hmm. which, we, which I seek to reintegrate mm -hmm. into the learning process. We need, I mean, in what other business could you afford not to appeal to the felt needs mm -hmm. of the consumer, mm -hmm. of the customer, of the patient, mm -hmm. of the client. It behooves us as educators to think in those terms. Yeah. How do we, as teachers, as professors, how can we meet the felt needs yeah. of fellow learners? I think that's, that is a really good point because the research is, is very clear that there's such a large number of, of students that are dropping out. And there's also the issue of students that need more remedial education just to meet university standards of academic uh, you know, requirements. Well, um, let, let me interject here because uh, your point is well taken. In my 15 years at the one institution where I taught in Montreal, what became crystal clear, Ms. Kennedy Dupay, is you know who suffers the most in the traditional, orthodox, right. it's the intelligent, the very intelligent. Right. I remember my students saying to me, some of the tops, mm -hmm. a rat in a cage could do this. Yeah, yeah. Why am I here? And then, you know, I, I, would, have, I would have people talk to me, I'm in an intro, intro psych course, in an amphitheater with 750 right. other people, right. the prof I have never met right. is a pinhead right. at the bottom of the <laughs> amphitheater yes. doing a PowerPoint presentation. With a microphone. <laughs> I could read this in a book. Right, right. So yeah. this tells us, and I maintain this is a first principle mm -hmm. of pedagogy. Education is first and foremost a humanizing, yes, a personalizing, mm -hmm. an individualizing. Mm -hmm. How do we bring back the individuation, mm -hmm. the person, right. personalizing, right. the humanizing right. of the learning process? And make it so that the student and the learner feels a sense of empowerment. 
and engagement. Yeah, engagement. Why do video games work? Because they feel they can actually make a difference. Right. What what yeah. struck me, you know, if you're a professor, that means you're a lifelong student. Mm -hmm, right. What struck me is how many courses did I take where it didn't matter if all the students were in the classroom or if none, the prof would give the same lecture to empty chairs. Right. <laughs> so this in impels us to ask the question, what difference does the student make? Mm -hmm. What difference does the fellow learner make? Yeah. How can we integrate them as part mm -hmm. of this dynamic mm -hmm. we call learning? The most successful professors and instructors to me have always been those professors and instructors who engage their students in dialogue, who ask questions, who listen, who are interested in what they think. And those were always the professors that I liked the most and that mm -hmm. I got the best grades with. Um, yeah, I, I, your point's very well taken. Yeah. Building connections, that's why I call it mm -hmm. ultimately education. Preschool, mm -hmm. elementary, mid-school, high school, Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's about the human connection. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, there was, a, there was a great song back in the 80s, and I'm dating myself here, but <laughs> I listened to all these songs because mm -hmm. my children are now adults, and that's mm -hmm. what they were listening sure, to in the 80s. Sure. And the song was, We All Need the Human Touch. Mm -hmm. That is the challenge before us as educators. Mm -hmm. How do we bring back the human touch? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we've got about uh, two minutes left, I believe. Um, this is kind of along the same lines. Um, in what ways must we as educators change pedagogy in ways that can promote student engagement and retention, and uh, not to mention developing critical thinking skills? Okay. Well, kind of this gets back to, again, a, a, a principle in marketing, a principle in public relations, a principal in business and enterprise, to what extent does the person feel invested in? Mm -hmm. So we want to create an atmosphere which enables the, the pupil, mm -hmm. the student, mm -hmm. the university um, learner mm -hmm. to appropriate mm -hmm. this phenomena we call education. Mm -hmm. How can they appropriate for themselves? How can they have a sense? I'm invested in this. Right. Okay, now I can't, I can't forget to mention that there's going to be a, a documentary. Yes, tomorrow, okay, tomorrow, Monday, the 2nd of November at 4.30 at Multnomah University. It's free. Okay. It's open to the public. Mm -hmm. It's Alanis Obamsuan's film, Professor Norman Cornett. Since when do we divorce the right answer from an honest answer? And immediately following it, we will have an open debate on education. And the operative principle of that public discussion is this. There's only one wrong question. That's the unasked question. Right. <laughs> OK. Um, well, let's see. We might have time for another question here. What are your plans um, after tomorrow and the next day? I'm a parent. I'm a grandparent. I love rock music. <laughs> I'm confessing. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking in terms of U2's song. Mm -hmm. What do we leave behind? Mm -hmm. My plan is to teach teaching cool. to teachers. Okay. Well, this is uh, the first half of the show is just about finished, and uh, the second half of the show will feature Bruce Broussard, and he will be interviewing Fred Stewart and my husband, Don Dupe. Thank you for coming today, and we'll see you again. Thank you, Ms. Kennedy Dupe. Thank you. <laughs> You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Welcome again to this segment of Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, hey, we've got some very busy times this time. As you know, we've got um, politics is right in the air from a national perspective, but here in Oregon, it's it's local too, big time. And what we're going to be doing today is that we're going to be in, interviewing a guy that's just, that's just um, basically, he's running for office. He's running for city council, position number three. You've seen him before here. He's very familiar with a number number of issues. He's a he's a small businessman, a very successful small businessman. I think that's very very important. He's a very people oriented kind of person because he's out there. He's in real estate, and so that means that he's got access to people. He's communicating with people. He's very familiar with the area that he wants to be, if you will, responsible for. And I'm I'm talking about the city of Portland. He's very very familiar with the city of Portland. And I'm talking about Fred Stewart. Fred, how you doing? How you doing, Bruce? Welcome aboard. I mean, this is quite a challenge. A very big challenge. Are you ready for it? Absolutely. I think you are. Yep. I've been preparing for this my entire life. I don't know that. Uh, this is another boot camp, see? Yep. Uh, unlike the Marine Corps, right? No, well, I've already lost about five pounds. So. I, I hear that you're going to be losing more than that. I'm going to be losing a lot more. <laughs> by, by May 17th, I think I'll have at least 100 I, I, pounds. I now. heard that. So he's still working right now as we yeah. speak in the day, but we forced him to come out here today. And what we're going to do is that uh, I've got with me Don Dupay is going to be with me. As you know, he's the he's our police representative. Uh, I'm looking at, I'm probably about 85% sure we're going to be going for the mayorship aspect of it. And, and so Don's going to be my, my police liaison. He's going to be the guy that's going to communicate because he's a prior police officer, Portland police. And, uh, and, and we're very interested. He's a very interesting person because a lot of folks are trying to go back and pass because they were such a, they did community policing. They did a lot of good police work back and during the time when Don was there. So that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I've associated myself with Don and, and I think we're going to have some exciting time. Then actually, you being on the city council, uh, that means we've got at least a good two votes, right? Mm -hmm. And then hopefully you might even consider maybe uh, taking being the, uh, the the so-called police commissioner uh, in in this in the, in the whole new administration. You know, because you've got that background for it, former marine and the whole nine yards. Well, if so. I if I am lucky enough to win, if I'm yes. able to win, if people do choose me to be the next city commissioner. Um, You'd be more than glad to serve, right? Oh, oh, yeah. Not only that, but I will definitely be asking for the Portland Police Bureau. Well, you will. Yeah. Well, you're asking the right guy, so that's probably the Don. And Don will give it to sign off. <laughs> right, Don? Absolutely. Okay, good. <coughs> well, look, I'll tell you what we're going to do, folks. We're going to give you an opportunity to uh, to get a sense of what, what, what is his rationale for running. Why does he want to run for, for as a city council seat? There more, there's more than just the, the police work aspect there because I'm very familiar with his background and whatever. But what we're going to do, we're going to do maybe uh, just a, a segment around a particular issue, which is one of probably, as far as I'm concerned, his priority uh, as far as um, the, the, the city of Portland is concerned. And, it's, and the whole issue, when you say gang, you know, gang problem, you think about the youth too at the same time. And Fred puts it just right. He talks about the fact it's youth and then getting into that intervention aspect of it and then to counter, if you will, those yeah. those issues of, and then dealing with the issue of gain. And that's where it's at. So there are several areas that we're going to, and for, from a future standpoint, we're going to be looking at things like transportation, which he's got a, he's got an excellent background in that particular area. Uh, you know, we got, we've got uh, the 911 situation. We spent a lot of money in that situation. And I understand it needs fixing. They're familiar with that. And then police work in general, and that's where Don and I, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be doing separate shows along that particular line. So we're going to probably have Fred on about four or five times. And in all due respect and respect to anybody who else is running for office, we're going to give them the opportunity to, for equal time. So we want to make sure we, you under, we understand that. The fact of the matter is, it's what's right for Portland. That's what we're looking for. That's what, that's what we're going to be doing here and as far as any interviews, is what's right for, for Portland and picking the right person to represent us. That's really what the, that's what the bottom line is all about. Okay. All politics are local. Exactly. Exactly. So, Fred, why don't we just get in there? We, we sort of talked about it because I asked you, point blank, why are you running? <laughs> and you, you gave me several different areas, but why don't you just share it with them again? Well, chiefly, the reason I'm running is I want to bring back common sense uh, to Portland City Council. Okay. Um, we don't have it there right now. Uh, the people that uh, we've voted in on city council are people who are not committed to Portland. They like Portland. Portland's where they live, but this is not their home. Um, the people of Portland aren't their people. It's the people uh, that they serve, but it's not their people. This is my people. This is my hometown. And we need to bring common Portland, Oregon sensibilities back to city council. Um, there are several areas where our city council for many years has lacked uh, commitment uh, to Portland. Um, resolving the gang issue, 
absolutely one of That's the most major. important things we have yeah. to do. Uh, we've got to stop the murders. We've got to stop the violence. And we've got to invest a little bit more in enforcement because we need to literally have a city where people who murder, rape, and, and are, are involved in sex trafficking are looking over their shoulders even when they're asleep. Mm -hmm. They need to feel uh, the, the, the citizens of Portland are going to be protected. But more than that, we need to start investing in our children before yeah. they get down to this, yeah. this, this area. It is extremely expensive mm -hmm. for the city of Portland to protect ourselves from these murderers, from these uh, pimps and these, these child molesters. It's very, very expensive. They're in this area because we've allowed it. Mm -hmm. And we've allowed it for too long. Mm -hmm. So if I'm elected to the Portland City Council, I'm definitely going to be uh, creating a, a bureau, um, a youth bureau, that is going to be investing in children um, between the ages of 8 and 18 um, right. after they get out of school. Mm -hmm. And we are going to have activities um, that children can be uh, involved in, and we're going to establish traditions that kids can count on and can, can be proud that they were part of. Um, we're going to have a way for the city of Portland to uh, reach out and, one, help kids that are good and are from good families uh, become better, and we're going to help kids that are from challenging situations mm -hmm. to have an option mm -hmm. um, that is not going to send them down the path of destruction. Mm -hmm. Because we're spending, I, I was told by a, a, a person from the city that every time there's a contact with a police officer as far as a gang member, you know, they're investigating a gang member, it costs the city uh, $300 or more. When they arrest them, it's $1,000 or more. And a murder trial, can easily cost two million dollars or more. Well, think of that. How much this city has spent just in the last thirty years. Well, you know, you know, on that particular note, and Don and I, we've talked about this before. One of the one of the biggest issues that's on the mind of a lot of us, uh, as far as the citizenry aspect of it, is the defining what is a gang person, what is a gang member. Mm -hmm. You know, and, you, know you get all sorts of <laughs> definitions about what the, you know, is he a criminal, is he this, is this, that, and the other. A lot of times it, it, it's a youth to mm -hmm. begin with. You know, there's no, there's no separation, if you will, from the standpoint of, uh, from a youth standpoint, during those formative years, they are youth. And if, if they get to be the adult, then they are criminals or are they youth? I mean, why, how well, do we get in it? Well, I look at it. What's my your definition, definition of is, What's uh, you definition? know, uh, it's not, there's nothing wrong with a club or, or a group getting together. People getting together and associating with common um, uh, beliefs and common interests. There's nothing wrong with that. Where they become a gang is when they start murdering people, when they start raping people, when they start sex trafficking our women and children. So, I what consider, I consider you, so what age group are you talking about? Um, when you make, when you the we're, the age, what are we talking about? The age group in Portland, uh, we've seen them as low in Portland history, as low as 12. Okay. But the average is between 15 and 25. That's the gang member. That's the gang member. 15 but to 25. But we've got them older, and we've got them younger. We're but not, generally speaking, they fall between 15 and 25. And that's basically are there no more after-school programs anymore? Well, there are, but they're very limited. Of, they're they're, they're limited. They're, they're limited. It's mostly uh, geared in the, in the wealthier areas. Um, to be honest, uh, they are. They're geared mostly in the wealthier areas, and even the ones that, they, that, that, that they've got, they're not appointed to really give the children what we really need. We, we need study halls. You know, I, I met some women um, that are trying to put a study hall in Lincoln High School. I met some other people who are trying to in, in put a study hall for the Grant kids. And another, another person who wants to do a study hall, believe it or not, out in Roosevelt. And I asked them, why do you need study halls? When I went right. to high school, you know, we didn't have study halls, and they said, well, we need a place, a safe place where kids can go after school mm -hmm. to do studying because a lot of these kids, they do not have mom or dad at home when they get home. So where's Portland Public Schools doing that area? Well, Portland Public Schools Are is... Are part of that process? Look, Portland be? Public Schools is having a hard time uh, making sure our teachers have enough resources to teach the, their, their, their curriculum, their mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. um, they're not even thinking about after school right now. Um, we've got two high schools um, that at one time they were thinking about not even having a sports program, uh, Jefferson and Grant. There's no football team at Benson. I mean, if they can't give a football team at Benson, geez, there is no way they're going to be doing study halls um, for Benson or anybody else. But there's a lot of, of infrastructure 
that that the children today and the children tomorrow are going to need um, if we want them to grow in the direction that we feel they need to grow, where they're going to be able to contribute to their lives and the lives of the community they live in. Hopefully that community is Portland, Oregon. You know, this is uh, something that's very critical in Portland, you know, right now. And it's also part of the explanation why we're having this gang problem right now. I mean, we've got kids right now, especially in the black community, that are literally growing up with no uh, uh, guidance, no structure, no foundation at all. They are literally... Um, growing up to kill us. You make that point about, you make the, in the black community. You know, and that's the other thing I'm going to throw out on the table. Well, we've had 26 murders this, yeah, but this year, are, but most and about people, 20 of them have been young okay. black all men. Right, all right, but wait a minute, <laughs> wait a minute. I hear what you're saying. Yeah. But in all due respect, the definition of a gang member, for many Portlanders, if you will, mm -hmm. is that they're black. Do we have any other, are there any other ethnic groups that are gang members or what? Well, it's not that they don't know that there's other gang members. They know there's Russian gangs. They know there's Asian gangs. They know there's Hispanic gangs. Okay. The reason why the black gangs yeah, get right. so much focus right. is they're so lethal. Right. We've had 26 gang shootings, I mean, uh, gang shootings that ended up in murders this year. Right. At least 20 of those gang members are, are black. We've had 132 gang shootings this year, Okay. Those are just the black ones. All within 14 and 25-year-olds. Right? Uh, uh, the average. The average I heard uh, uh, for being killed is about 20. About That's 20. the average. That's the average. We've had over 60 uh, wounded. Now, we've got a black population of only 30,000 people. You know, I mean, do you understand how atrocious yeah. these figures are? I mean, a black person in Portland between the ages of 15 and 25 is literally... 2,000 times more likely to get shot mm. than a white kid between 15 and 25. That's just ugly. Well, you, you and, and, you and hold it, this it, goes it, into it, why it, I'm it, running it, for it. office. Go on. Yes, go. Okay. I, I we don't have a city council okay. that is passionate about protecting the citizens of Portland. And when I say the citizens of Portland, not just the black people. We definitely want black people to stop shooting each right. other. But where do these bullets go when they don't hit a black person? They yeah. can literally kill anybody. Mm -hmm. And I've told my friends for months, one day, we're going to have a straight bullet and it's going to kill a white person. Maybe a young white person, maybe an old white person. you got to remember, we don't have a black community anymore that lives in one particular area. And these shootings, uh, these 132 shootings have happened all over the city. Downtown, east side, west side, northwest, at our schools, in our parks. And I, and I tell my friends, I said, we are about on the verge of having some major tragedies. It's a tragedy anytime somebody gets killed, especially, you know, anybody. But what about when white people start getting murdered in Portland? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and what are they going to do? I don't think that anybody on our city council currently cares enough about the citizens of Portland to make the investments necessary to protect our lives. They, they don't. Um, and the guy that I'm running against... He's more concerned about letting people know how much he loves Bernie Sanders than how much he loves the that's people Steve of Portland. Novak. That's and that's Steve Novick okay. than, the, than the citizens of Portland. I mean, I'm yeah. pretty sure he loses <laughs> sleep hoping that when Bernie Sanders comes to Portland, he gets to meet him. But what about the, the average person in Portland? Mm -hmm. How are they doing? Mm -hmm. Is he passionate about them? And my answer is I don't think he is. Matter of fact, I know he's not. Hmm. Well, let me, let, me, let me get Don in here. I, I just, Don, what, what about doing your particular time, Don? Well, uh, what, what would they call then? It what, shows what my young age. People? But when study hall, when I went to high school, study hall was third period, and you better be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was an everyday thing. You went to school, study hall was third period. What happened to that? Well, a lot of it's technology. A lot of it's how much our kids have to study. you got to remember, there's a lot of homework now given to kids well, where true. they have to email it and turn it <laughs> yeah, in. Yeah. We've got households in Portland that do not have Internet. Yeah. Mm. Okay? Um, you know, so if you want to help a kid <clears throat> who lives in a household that where the family can't afford Internet, yeah. then you need places like a study hall that they can go to right. so they can have access to a laptop or... A or, computer or a computer, lab. Acute, a computer, computer lab. lab, or yeah. something, yeah. but uh, also serves other functions. That, that study hall is a place where information can be uh, uh, passed out to children about other opportunities that, yeah. uh, of, of, of activities and interests that they can engage in after school. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it could also help address some nutrition issues. 
because we've got kids right. that are going to school right yeah. now. I mean, it, we had free lunches when I was in school. <laughs> but today, we've got a lot more kids getting free lunches because we got a lot more parents, a lot more families under stress financially. I mean, we've been reading in the newspapers about what's been going on with the rents in Portland. Mm -hmm. We've got families right now that are paying at, uh, at least 50% more for their space costs that they were paying in 2010. Right. And, in the, and, and since 2010, the average person in Portland has only seen their wages go up about 4%. Mm -hmm. So if, you're, if your rent has gone up 50% <laughs> in five years, but your raises of your income have only gone up 4%, you can see that there can be a, some yeah. issues with, 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 with paying for necessities so you buy, in this so market. You, so you buy off the $15 an hour that the city just kind of gave some of their employees. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. You we we live in a city where you need, a, actually more than that, uh, we, people need about $18 an hour um, to be able to live the way they did in 1983. You know, I, 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 it is very bad for Portland right now. Um, our wages aren't growing. Uh, we've got lots of jobs. Every time I hear a politician, especially a white politician, because when a white politician looks at a black person and say, hey, we got a lot more jobs than we had back then, uh, but they're ignoring that a lot of those jobs aren't going to black people, then I know, yeah, that guy doesn't give a damn about me. <laughs> um, but also, too, they're, they're not, they're not t being honest, honest with their constituents by letting people know, hey, our wages aren't growing. And our wages aren't growing because we're not a market. We're manufacturing and, and, and other um, uh, high-impact so service levels. So what are you going to do about it? Well, as a city commissioner, I'm going to always be promoting Portland and doing what I can to help businesses expand here. we got to become a more business-friendly city because we need wages to grow. But I also want more businesses to move here. I want businesses that make stuff to move here. Small, I'm not talking about bringing in a, I mean, I'd love to bring a Tesla here, but I mean, we, we, we've got opportunities to bring some small level manufacturing here to Portland and, and manufacturing is the key to increasing wages. We need more manufacturing jobs um, to be able to increase wages. It brings more money in, in every aspect of, of Portland, whether it comes taxes, whether it's um, more people working, uh, more services that, uh, that, uh, that are needed to, to support those businesses, those, those manufacturing businesses. Um, we got a lot of work we got to do in that area because right now, the people of Portland, though they're getting more jobs than they were five years ago, those jobs are not necessary at a level of pay that addresses the way a Portlander lives today. Mm -hmm. And moreover than that, the average Portlander getting a job today, unless they've got a special situation with their, their new employer, they can only expect that their wages are going to grow an average of 1% to 2% over the next three years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really abysmal right now. So, so, so the unemployment rate you're saying is pretty high right now at this point. Now. Well, I say the underemployment rate's even higher. I'm more concerned about the the underemployment. The underemployment. The, the underemployment. Well, they're unemployed. Rate. They're, the, not, they're, not, they're, they're employed, paying, but they're, they're paying the rent. They're, they're not paying yeah. the rent. And, and then you know we, you know with the issues that we got with checks and balances coming. With, I mean, I've literally talked to landlords who have tripled their rent this year. I, I literally have talked to a landlord that went from charging his tenants eight hundred dollars a month to twenty four hundred dollars a month. Here in Portland. Here in Portland. And, and he feels comfortable with that because he can get it. And I understand this is a business, yeah, but look at what that did to that family. The family, well, they're just three people, but still a family. They had to move. But where do they move to? So, but someone moved in. Somebody else moved in, you know, a young guy, single guy. He moved in paying the $2,400 a month. But what I'm getting to is... That's the and who, pick up, who picked up the tab for the for the three people that were out? You know, I don't know where they moved to, but the thing is, I know what they were they were living where they could afford eight hundred dollars a month. They're not going to find that a, another place like that for less than twelve hundred. <laughs> they're not going to find another home like that for less than twelve hundred. That's a big problem. So, Matter of fact, how you gonna, so how are you going to address that? Let's, let's talk about how you going to address that. Well, you know, what with my do? background in real estate, there's some right. things that I want to do uh, with the local, you know, real estate community. To, to you know, first, I'm, I'm going to ask my, my 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 landowner friends to please not go after excessive profit taking. That's the first thing I'm going to do. But there needs to be some controls to protect uh, tenants uh, put in so that they are not victims of, of excessive profit taking. And we do have a lot of that. Well, now take take this out now. Now you got we got well, I say former mayor now because really he's a he's a lame duck right mm -hmm. now. Charlie Hill, I mean, he he did a big push on all these high rise and apartments and this that and the other, mm -hmm. new parking this that and the other. Are you going to follow up with that piece? Or are you going to you going to take over from that point on and continue building those kinds of 
Uh, well, we're going to have to. Well, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm also hoping the state walks away from inclusionary zoning. We need to allow in, um, inclusionary zoning. Which means? Well, well we're, not, we're, we're, we're building not just for the rich, but we're also building for the middle class and the poor. Okay. We need, we need to be able to do that. Another thing we need but to do is we need to bring back stuff. multifamilies. Yeah, and when I say multifamilies, I mean the small ones, the fourplexes, the threeplexes, and the duplexes. But, it, is, it is nearly Im illegal nearly illegal to build a duplex in the city of Portland. And that's cheaper than building uh, skinny minis. Um, and it would but the word is, is that the numbers, are, well, the numbers are saying we need high rise. I mean, that's we, what we've we been need, told. Is it? We, we do need high rises, but that's not the only thing we need. Stacking them up. Well, yeah, it, we do need those, but we don't need uh, nothing but those. Okay, we need a good mixture of housing. That cover a wide range of cost, uh, you know, areas. So we have a spectrum of rental opportunities and purchasing opportunities. But look like the major focus up there in Northeast Portland. Look like that property has gone up so much. I mean, wow. What was? Well, in some cases in Northeast Portland, you know, we in would some areas. We, you know in some areas, you got to remember, it, it would be easier if we would just allow duplexes and fourplexes and threeplexes because we wouldn't ha be necessarily charging the, the developer so much as uh, you know system de development fees to build those properties. And those costs, those 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 lack of charges can be passed on to the end user, which is either the renter or the landlord. Mm -hmm. In some cases, the city of Portland is charging. Uh, a, a developer, a hundred thousand bucks, anywhere between sixty-five to a hundred thousand dollars before they break ground. That's why I tell a lot of people. Dollars for demolition. Exactly. Right? Well, that's why I tell a lot of my friends. It's very difficult to, to build low-income housing or affordable housing the way we look at it um, with the system development fees that the city of Portland is charging. And you know, we should allow some more duplexes. We should allow some threeplexes. We should allow some fourplexes to be developed. They would be cheaper for the developer to build, and they'd be cheaper for the market to rent and to purchase. And we would allow more people Don, to have opportunities question. to buy. He's, he's Can I there. ask what might be a stupid question? Mm -hmm. Do we need more housing, or do we need less people? I mean, how far? Are, are, <laughs> no, only seriously. How far are our resources going to go? Well, We're already the city of about, Portland. Wait a minute. We don't have time already for our children. Okay. How, where are the resources? There was a study done about 20 years ago in the city of Portland, specifically called the Carrying Capacity Study. Yes. And the Carrying Capacity Study said <coughs> a well-managed the city of Portland. The market of Portland can handle up to 9 million people here, living here. Bullshit. Okay? Hey, come, give me a break. Up to yeah. 9 million Nine, people living here. That's, City of Portland? City of Portland. Well, the, the, the market. No, no, no. no. The market of Portland. Fred, the market of Portland. Jesus, not, nine, not city million. boundaries. Jesus, you're smiling while you said it. I don't want yeah, LA. I don't want San Francisco. <laughs> well, the, there's, there's another talking, problem. There's no, another you know what problem he's talking about, Don? He's talking about annexing California and annexing Washington. No, we might have to annex Vancouver. And annex with Clark County. No, I, but no. I knew it was what, there. What we what we need to do what we what we need to do here. It's gotta stop somebody. What, what we, we need to do then is we gotta find a way to get people to stop telling other people how awesome it is to live here, because. You know, we've got this thing called the U.S. Constitution, and that allows people to roam throughout the country wherever they want to go. And we can't stop the thousands of people that are moving here every month. Well, no, former you Governor Tom you know, McCall did. You know, you far, stop him he like, said, "Visit, but don't stay." But you guess stop what? him because there's no place to live. He was yeah. a Republican. And I'm didn't sorry, want to listen you can't to move to Portland. There's no. <laughs> well, place it didn't to work. Anymore. You know, <laughs> it didn't work. That's what he said. You know, when he when he said it, it didn't work. But. You know, if the, if you can figure Jeez. out a way to keep people from telling their friends and family outside of Portland, outside of Oregon, how cool it is to live here, we might see this exodus to our state, to our city, slow down. But we literally have thousands of people moving to Portland it's every, a cool every, place every to month. Live. I'm sorry, there's no more apartments there's no here. Place. There's, there's nothing. There's, there's no, no land. Place you here. told me that. There's no more property. Have, there's you no more buy. school for you. There's nothing. There's not enough police service for you. I'm sorry, it's full. We got a ten-gallon bucket, and we're putting to trying to put fifteen gallons in it. Our bucket. So, so is your full. solution is that we just don't build anymore at all. My solution we, is you, wait. My solution is you stop building until we catch up. There you go. Once we catch up, what do you mean by catch up? Catch up with what we got. If we got enough, no, no, place, we, enough we, fire, enough no, no, water. We've got a shortage of housing right now. We've got a shortage no, of everything. We, got a, we got a, we got a shortage of literally everything that no, we no, need. No, are we going to let this guy? I don't see it that are way. Are we going to let this guy? We don't have a shortage. we got too many people. Are we going to let no, this guy? No, we got guy. a shortage of housing. <laughs> I, got, I got about a minute. We got a shortage of housing. I got a minute. We don't have a shortage of people. Well, we got a shortage of housing. Too many people. Nine million, he says. Hey, nine million is coming over, man. Huh? 
Uh-huh. I'm sorry. You that's can't. that's the potential. That's the carrying capacity <laughs> potential Christ. of the the Portland market, not just the city of Portland. Uh, you know, that includes Vancouver and Hillsboro and everybody well, else. I what about when we run out of water? We won't run out of water. Yes, we will. No, we won't. Then no resource is infinite. No, we, we won't run out of water. <laughs> Nine million people. That's a, I don't, that's I don't a lot of water. That's a lot of water. <laughs> that's a lot of water right now. Nestle is already <laughs> trying to steal Columbia River. Yeah. We so they want the water. I'm not for that. I'm not, I'm not for that. Um, unless they're going to pay their employees $25 an hour. Well, hey, look. We got, now, we got, they're going to pay the employees wait, over wait, $25 wait, bucks an wait, hour. Wait, we, can we, talk. we got about 50 seconds left. Uh-huh. Give us a closing statement. Yeah. Why should they vote for you? Everybody, the reason why I'm running is, is one reason and one reason only is I want to serve the people of Portland. This is my hometown. Um, We've gone way too long with people coming to Portland trying to make us out to be some things that we're not. What we are is we are a pioneer town with common sense, common re- uh, sensibilities and values, and we look out for each other. That's right. That's okay. But no nine million. <laughs> I don't think any of us will be thank, here if we ever reach that number. Thank, thank you, folks. Thank you, folks, very much. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Fred, for being with us. Don, thanks again. Hey, we'll see you next week with another candidate. Take care. Have a yeah. good one.